with 16 days to go until the midterm elections and with the president facing the reality that Democrats, many of them impeachment hungry, could take back the House. He's back in no holds barred campaign mode, going back to what worked in 2016, seizing on a hardline immigration message and endorsing violence against journalists, seemingly, even as he accuses Democrats of inciting the mob. Joining me now, Senator Ben Sass, Republican from Nebraska. He's the author of a new book called Them, Why We Hate Each Other and How to Heal. Uh, Senator Sass, thanks for joining us. Your book deals with why the country is so divided right now. Uh, I was reading it while this happened, and I want you to take a listen to what President Trump had to say at a recent rally, and he mentioned that Montana congressman who ultimately pleaded guilty to physically assaulting a journalist whose crime was he tried to ask him a question about health care. Take a listen. Any guy that can do a body slam, he's my kind of... And I said, oh, this is terrible. He's going to lose the election. Then I said, well, wait a minute. I know Montana pretty well. I think it might help him. And it did. Now, Senator, you write quite compelling in your book about the, the need for all of us in America to see the humanity of each other. And I have to say, I've been surprised at how quiet Republicans have been about the president of the United States joking about a criminal assault on a reporter. What was your reaction to that? You know, I got to admit, I don't follow the rallies closely, uh, but, you know, I believe that the First Amendment is the beating heart of the American experiment. So we need to have a president who celebrates the First Amendment and not pretends that beating up a reporter is OK. But I think what you hear from a lot of Nebraskans who also, I think, tune out most of the rallies is there's sort of a short term, long term thing going on. And people feel like the president's rhetoric is kind of short term playful. I don't think it's OK, but I do think most people tune most of it out. I think what we need to be having a conversation about is the long term of how does the next generation understand the American experiment? Because right now, we don't have much shared sense of what it is. But it's not playful to joke about assault, is it? No. No, I mean, the guy was convicted of a crime. And the First Amendment, free speech, press, religion, assembly, protest, the right of redress of grievances, these are things we believe are rights that 320 million Americans have, not because government gives us these rights, but because there are rights by nature, the founders would have said, and governments are shared project to secure them. So we need a president and all other elected officials to be stewarding and shepherding our shared understanding of that to the next generation. So no, it's not OK. But I, I do think that it's sort of baked into the president's stock price that sort of this uh, amoralistic take he has on it is just what most people think the president's going to do. And most people where I live sort of ignore most of it. Some think it's funny. Uh, some are really anxious about it. But most people just think, well, that's kind of how the president talks. Um, we need to do better than that. But I also think um, there, there's a danger in pretending each new rally is uh, immediate urgent. I, I wish he did it differently, obviously. You're on the uh, uh, Senate Armed Services Committee. I want to ask you about the U.S. response to the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, the Saudi journalist. President Trump seems to think American jobs and profits through the tens of billions of dollars of arms deals with the Saudi Arabians are a clear reason to, to moderate the U.S. response. Uh, on the other hand, uh, philosophically, uh, Senator Marco Rubio said on CNN, quote, there isn't enough money in the world to purchase back our credibility on human rights and the way nations could conduct themselves. Where do you come down? Yeah, I think that's well said by Marco. So we need to recognize that arms sales are always means to an end. They're not the end. Uh, the end is the American idea, and the end is stability in the world so that problems abroad don't come home to roost for us. So we don't do arms sales for the purposes of the profits from arms sales. We do arms sales because we want to be allied with different countries around the globe that believe in our values and have a long-term sense of what we're up to together and why we have that alliance. Saudi's got a lot of explaining to do, uh, and I think everything should be on the table. The intel that I've read is obviously not as exhaustive as the intel that the president sees. Um, but I think the cover stories from the Saudis are a mess. You don't bring a bone saw to an accidental fist fight uh, inside an embassy in Turkey or a consulate in Turkey. So the Saudis have said a whole bunch of crap that's not right, accurate or true. We know that. Uh, and we need to have some shared principles about what we're trying to get done if we ally with them uh, in particular ways. Policies flow from that. Arms sales are one policy. They're a means. They're not an end. 
Let's turn back to your book. Uh, you have some harsh words in the book for partisans on both sides, uh, including Fox News host Sean Hannity. Uh, you write his goal is not to promote a conservative agenda or offer coherent arguments against liberal principles, but instead, quote, his core cause is to rage. Hannity responded on Twitter to you, saying, quote, after your book fails, I will gladly debate you about how the success of the last two years never would have happened with your never-Trumper positions. Also, we can talk about why I know you are a con artist and phony. You owe the great people of Nebraska an apology, unquote. I wanted to give you an opportunity to respond to, to Sean Hannity. Yeah, so um, I've, I've told Sean I'd be happy to debate him in a, in a neutral environment about whether or not his business model is good for America, because it's bad for America. And I think we need to back up. This isn't about Sean Hannity. It's about the whole politainment industry, which is I think the vast majority of Americans want politics to maintain a framework for ordered liberty, but they don't want politics to swallow up every sector and every aspect of life, every institution and every discussion. And so most people are tuning this out. And I think that's it's important for us to sort of recognize what's happening in the way we consume media now broadly. In the 1950s, I Love Lucy had a 68% share. It wasn't important content, but it was shared content. Everybody in America knew what Lucy and Desi were doing, and it was something you had in common with your neighbors, even if you were arguing with them about a project at work or if you differed on politics. Today, the most watched cable programming in America, Hannity's number one and Rachel Maddow's usually number two, both of them have the same basic business model, which is try to intensify the political addictions of the 1% of America that's listening to you. And you can always just demonize your opponent, never give a fair shake to what the other argument is. And I say that as one of the most conservative members of the U.S. Senate. I'm, I'm the second or third most conservative member of the Senate, so I'm not uh, mealy-mouthed indifferent on policy. But I don't think policy differences mean that people I differ with on a given policy I have to regard as evil and therefore not as a part of a shared America. And the business model that people like Hannity advance, it's not good for the next generation because it doesn't get to any sense of what a shared republic is doing together. You write in the book uh, about the tendency of individuals to overlook the flaws of those, quote, in the tribe. You say, quote, there is a deep and corrosive tribal <laughs> impulse to act as if the enemy of my enemy is my friend, but sometimes the enemy of your enemy is just a jackass. Um, I wanted to ask you, because I was reading this and I was thinking about the Kavanaugh hearings, when President Trump publicly mocked Christine Blasey Ford as the crowd laughed, um, and the response from Republicans, I have to say, was rather muted. Um, do you think your tribe failed Christine Blasey Ford by, at the very least, not condemning the president when he mocked her testimony? Yeah, so I went to the Senate floor after the president's uh, mocking rally, I think it was in Mississippi, and, and made a speech about why the Me Too movement is important and why the Me Too movement doesn't belong to Republicans or Democrats and politics shouldn't swallow it because there's a whole culture of sexual violence that needs to be uh, called out and shouted out and mores need to be changed. And most of that's bigger than and outside of politics. So I, I was critical of what the president said there. But bigger picture, I think it's really important for us to recognize that this political tribalism, which is amping in our time, is filling a vacuum of the collapse of the natural tribes, the, the normal tribes that give people's lives happiness and meaning. The happiness literature is pretty clear. You're happy if four things are true. Do you have a tight nuclear family? Do you have a few deep friendships? Uh, do, you have a share, do you have shared vocation? Do you have a sense that you have meaningful work? And do you have a local worshiping community or a theological or philosophical framework to make sense of death and suffering? Those things are all local, and those are kinds of tribes that usually in human history have been thick. They're thinning in our time because of the digital revolution, and politics is trying to fill that void. Political tribes aren't going to make you happy. Just because you're a Republican or Democrat, that doesn't mean other partisans are going to join you uh, and comfort you late in life when you're lonely. So there's a lot, there's a lot we need to do, but we need to recognize the, the decline of the good tribes is a huge part of why political tribalism is amping in our time. And you write a great deal about it in your book, Them, Why We Hate Each Other and How to Heal, the only book I've ever read that quotes both Adam Sandler and George Washington. Ben Sass, thanks so much for your time, Senator. Thanks for the invite, Jake.